Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Foundations of Business Management 1104. Hope you're having a great summer as we continue to march towards um, our next uh, next exam, but also just kind of marching towards the really the functional units and the functional areas um, within business. So, you know, we've kind of explored the top level view, global business, economics, ethics, kind of the foundations of business. Uh, we started to look at entrepreneurship, and now we're going to deep dive into the functional areas. So over the next several weeks, uh, you know, we will be taking a look and allow you to explore and discover the various majors within Pamplin College of Business, but also the functional areas and kind of giving you an appetizer, if you will, of some of the uh, roles and responsibilities, again, some of the functions that you might see along the way. So let me go ahead and share my screen and kick off. We're going to be uh, talking about chapter eight, which um, if, and again, hopefully everyone has read the chapter. I know you probably get tired of me saying that, but it helps me uh, to remind you that you're reading the chapter and, uh, and doing the right things with regards to that. Uh, so this is management and leadership. Before we get too far, you do have another exam coming up, uh, exam two, which is scheduled for Wednesday, June 15th. It will cover everything up until that point. So chapters one all the way to chapter 12. We don't cover chapters nine and 11 uh, any longer. In this course, you actually will get it in a 3000 level management course, principles of management. Um, so again, just be sure to have that on your, um, on your calendar. Um, as far as where we're at within the schedule, you can see here today, Thursday, June the 9th, we're on the management and leadership side. As I said before, we've already covered chapter six and seven earlier this week. Uh, on Friday the 8th, we'll go into operations management and then moving into uh, chapter 13, which is managing human resources. In addition to the HR, we actually talk about emotional intelligence, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. There is a real estate module as well that is on uh, Tuesday the 14th. And uh, I'll also be doing a... Uh, a, an exam review, uh, exam two review session will be on Tuesday, June 14th. And then, as I said before, your exam, your next exam, exam two, is on Wednesday, June 15th. Okay, with that being said, let's jump into management and leadership. I'm going to share with you a video. Uh, this is a video that spotlight, that spotlights the Department of Management and the various majors. In this video, you're going to hear the word options used. Um, we the Department of Management has now switched these options to majors. The university has accepted it. And, uh, and so moving forward, these options now are specific majors within the Department of Management. Uh, but anyway, this video kind of gives you an idea of what those majors look like, some job opportunities, career insights, um, and the such. So feel free to uh, watch this video now.
All right, so you can take a chance uh, and uh, take a look at that video again if you want. All the majors are represented um, by videos on the YouTube, the Pamplin YouTube channel. They're also uh, in the modules um, here on this Canvas uh, summer session page. And as we go into some of the other uh, majors and functions, I'll share the uh, videos of those majors as well. You can see the learning objectives on the screen today for chapter eight. Uh, man, so let's look at management. And it's not what it used to be. So when I first got into business, um, I was actually still a student um, at Radford University and was working for a startup division. So we were a multi-million, part of a multi-million dollar company, almost a billion dollar company, but we were a startup located here in Southwest Virginia, just down the road in Dublin, and started out with 11 folks. Actually, before I left, um, six years later, we had almost 350. The whole point of it is that was 30 some years ago, and back then, um, there really was this autocratic um, sort of management style. Uh, one person sort of telling everyone what to do. Employees were basically in this mode of, uh, they, the thought process is they were paid to think, excuse me, paid to work, not to think. This was in a manufacturing environment too. So you can kind of, you know, people were coming in, punching the clock, going to work, doing their job, you know, uh, maybe there's some performance updates on a, on a daily basis, but at the end of the day, there really wasn't much participation to lead. And, you know, you, I say that from a production standpoint, but I was even on the middle management side where, again, know your job, do your job, and do it. So really no ability to grow. I did have a great mentor there, but I'm just talking about generally in business, this is what management was all about. Fast forward, and over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, maybe 20, um, the, the manager has changed. The management place has changed. The role has changed. Younger and more aggressive. Um, certainly a growing number of women um, in, in, the, in the profession needs to be more. It's definitely not enough. Uh, we need to do more to that. Uh, anyone interested the collegiate women in business, fantastic organization to be a part of. Uh, there's a couple of um, co-ed fraternities. So men and women uh, being able to be involved and, and get um, hands-on learning. Fewer now, fewer managers are from elite universities. Managers now, instead of being based on your degree or where you came from, your pedigree, so to speak, it's now based on your initiative and your critical thinking, problem solving, uh, getting involved. Um, and so there's a lot more on that. Emphasis on teams and team building. That's why you're, uh, you know, that's why you're in teams and your academic journey here at Virginia Tech. Many of you will be doing internships and you'll notice that you're in teams there. Uh, managers need to be skilled communicators and team players for sure. Um, how to be a successful manager. And the textbook gives you efficiency and effectiveness. Those words look very, very similar, but different. So efficiency is about time. How do we use the resources that are given to us? We talked about earlier in, um, in chapters four and five, the use of you know, uh, labor, capital, time, and equipment. How does the manager deploy the workforce, the processes, the procedures, the people, in such a way to maximize the efficiency within, a, within an organization. Effectiveness, um, and that's the ability to achieve objectives, goals, um, you know, with based on features and quality and performance, that's effectiveness. Having the, this overarching goal and objective, but how effective is it done kind of thing. So for example, we may, uh, if you know, if we're if we're in the construction industry, we may finish a building on time. Very, very excellent use of the time. We were under budget from a manpower, people power standpoint, so we saved money. But then within six weeks, twelve weeks, all of a sudden, there's all kinds of issues. Doors aren't shutting properly. The the roof is leaking. The windows um, have air coming in. This is something that then looks at the effectiveness, um, you know, the ability to have those quality performance or features over time. So
So it takes the combination of the two, efficiency plus effectiveness to equal success. Very, very important. Managers, plan, organize, lead, and control. Managers, plan, organize, lead, and control. Textbook gives you an awesome outline of what that means. I'm gonna to touch on a few of those today. Now, the word control is not necessarily what we think of. I mean, we think of the word control, it's physically moving something and controlling the outcome. Um, that's not going to happen. I mean, I think of the word control and I think of my ex-wife telling me where I need to be, what I need to be doing, which was awesome from a scheduling standpoint, but she was definitely controlling the situation. It's all good. Um, but, but in this particular pace, it, um, word, the word control is measuring the results so that we can improve over time, okay? So let's look at a strategic plan. And uh, in a strategic plan, there's a mission statement, great opportunity to define the core values of the organization, leadership, um, who are they, what are they about, conducting a SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, setting the goals and objectives of the organization, um, you know, how, how, what goals and objectives are needed to, to get that performance um, and to be able to meet their, um, and then developing tactical and operational plans. It's a very, very important piece. So strategic planning, let's talk about what that looks like. And step one is it's this process. It's a course of action. Why does the organization exist? What value does the organization create? And so think about some of the Airbnb, who are they? Why are they in existence? Tesla, who are they? What are they about? The Oprah Winfrey network and the Oprah Winfrey brand, who are they? What are they about? You know, this is something to do. So in my last organization, we did quite a bit of strategic planning. I joined the organization in 2008. And by 2010, you know, the owners, which was a second generation uh, group, wanted to really change who we were and what we were about. And, uh, and so we sat down and we said, okay, where have we been? Who are we? Which kind of helps to understand this legacy piece. But it, more importantly, where do we want to go? And at that time, we were at about 40 million plus or minus. We had actually dipped to about 38 million. We did some competitive analysis. We thought, who could we be? Who are we today? Um, what could be some aspirations um, that we could look towards? What about people? You know, what do we need to get there people-wise? What about equipment and plants and processes? What, what do we need to do? So lots to talk about, lots to go through, and we put together a five-year plan. Now, what was nice about that five-year plan is, of course, it include goals and objectives, the value that we wanted to create in the market, but it started to look at our branding like if we're going to do this, then we need to also kind of rebuild who we are and restructure. And so we went through that. Part of that's a vision statement. You know, what, what does the organization want to become? An organization is today something, but what do they want to be? Where do they want to, you know, realistically, um, but aspirational to uh, where they want to get to? And there has to be some numbers in that. So it's a broad explanation of where the organization is trying to go. So think about vision 2020, eyesight, where does the uh, organization want to go? These are some uh, companies that you might recognize. And these are their vision statements from a, a few years ago. You know, Tesla, obviously sustainable transport, mass electric cars, Walt Disney, just to make people happy. That's the vision statement. Pretty simple, straightforward. That's what they want to do. That's where they want to go. Uh, PayPal, uh, convenient, secure, cost effective. Now, mission different. Mission is more about um, the fundamental purpose of the organization. So vision statement, where do they want to go? Why does the organization exist? Mission statement is where do they want to go and why do they want to exist? Okay. And so you can see the various mission statements here, inspiration, innovation, um, and those pieces. Now, SWOT analysis, we go back to the uh, story I was telling you about my last organization. This was an important piece to sit down and understand the strengths of the company, people, processes, um, 
We had really good research and development, outstanding plants, although what we also realized on the weakness side, because we had four different plants, on the weakness side was, you know, a couple of the plants needed some updates. Um, you know, they really had kind of old and uh, needed some uh, investment and some innovation. The other part is then looking at the external factors. So those are the opportunities and threats. And the external factors can, can influence a company either in a positive or negative way. And these things can be like uh, economic conditions so or regulations, customer expectations, and things like that. So strengths and weaknesses, internal, what's the company look like? Um, being very fair, honest, looking at things in a very critical way. This is where consultants, so in the video earlier, talked about careers, consulting is an amazing career for, for certain managers and leaders. So consultants can come in, organizations can hire consultants, come in because they provide a third party, much more objective view uh, when it comes to SWATs and when it comes to uh, competitive analysis. So our organization did, we, we actually used a consultant, two different ones for two different reasons. Uh, to kind of come in and give us that objective view because, you know, quite frankly, if you ask uh, most of the time, if you ask managers and leaders, they're going to be, hey, things are going well. That's why I'm in leadership. There, there doesn't need to be any change. If so, what will happen to my job, right? So they kind of get into this agency problem. Uh, they become a little bit egocentric and not so much uh, looking at things in a broader objective way. Here's a good example. This is a SWOT analysis of a brewery, and, uh, and I'm not going to read each and every one of them, but you can see there's three to four bullet points per area. Um, and now what's the other important piece is to understand, especially on the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, is to then use that data. So this is a so what, who cares moment. SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, strengths, high five, celebrate, let's cut cake you know, uh, let's toast the strengths, keep doing what we're doing. What else can we do to invest in those strengths? Um, just like your strength finders, keep doing what you're doing, invest more, practice more, do better in those strengths. But on the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, this is an area where we, where organizations have to really think about um, mitigation strategies, right? So weaknesses, what can we do um, you know, to improve, for example, non-tax, non-tax savvy. So there's a reputation for this particular example that, um, that they don't re really have a strong reputation when it comes to technology. Well, what could they do to get there? What, what are the competitors doing? And could there be something done in that regard? And then opportunities and threats, same thing. What kind of goals and objectives, what kind of plans could be put together to maximize uh, or and, and maximize the mitigation strategy and or in, make improvements that will mitigate or, or eliminate opportunities. So setting up goals and objectives, many of you probably have heard of SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-bound. These are important so that, so that there can be a time management and also a performance management review of goals. Are they being met? If not, why? Um, you, know, does the, do, you know, does the organization need to invest more? And if so, how much? Does it, do they need to hire more people? If so, how and where and when? Uh, goals are the major accomplishments over a long period of time. Objectives are the shorter term targets that helps to get to the goal. So I know a lot of times I'll have students that will visit me in office hour and go, you know, goals and objectives to me are the same thing. And they do sort of feel that way as we're going into them, as we're setting them up, but they're very different. Again, think about a goal on a football field or a soccer pitch, all right? We're, that's where we, we, you know, we want to start from, you know, from the five-yard line, but we've got to go all the way down the field, 95 yards to the goal line. That's the, peer, that's the goal, score a touchdown, kick a field goal, it's just score, right? What's the objectives to get there? The shorter term performance targets. Where do we need to go? What plays do we need to make happen in order to move the ball down the field? Very, very important. 
Think about your goals and objectives. Your goal, walk across the stage, get, should be two goals, right? Walk across the stage, get your diploma uh, from Virginia Tech. The most important goal, I think, for everyone at the university as a student is to have a career, right? To start a career and, and, you know, and be employable within six months after graduation. Outstanding goal, have a career, okay? So then the objectives are what classes, what internships, what events, what clubs, organizations, all of these then become the objectives for you as a student to achieve that long-term goal, okay? Just some examples, goals, again, long-term accomplishments, seeks to achieve, right? So an example is 10% return on sales in the first five years. That is specific, it's measurable, has time uh, to it. The objective to get to that 10% return um, then is year one sales of $200,000 and a profit of 20,000, okay? Again, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, relevant and time measured. So then we get into tactical and operational. Tactical um, or shorter components, five one-year tactical plans, okay? Operational plans are shorter durations, one to two months, um, very detailed action steps. This is where project management comes into play, looking at a timeline, looking at people, um, allocation of resources, all of that. So what if the plan doesn't work? And I can tell you it's inevitable. The plan won't work, okay? It's just going to be that way. I can guarantee you, let's go back to February of 2020. And if we were to uh, quiz or survey is a better term, if we were to ask and survey the top 100 CEOs in February of 2020, how many of them would say our plan is perfect? Nothing's going to happen. This little Chinese flu thing in uh, Wuhan, okay, we might interrupt this for a week or two. I, we hear about it, but at the end of the day, it's going to happen. I would say all of them, all 100 of them would have been wrong. And there's no way in this world that anyone at that point had in their strategic plan a week before that, or even six months before that, six days before that, to have what would go on for the next 18 to 24 months. It's inevitable, the plan will not work. So guess what? Even with great planning, things don't always turn out the way they're supposed to. The plan could be flawed. Maybe there's a business environment that shifted unexpectedly. Look at where we're at with the inflation right now. Uh, no one would have predicted 11%. Sure, there was always naysayers, there's always gonna be someone, whether on the far left or the far right, that will always be skeptical of whoever is in the White House on the opposite party. I get that. But generally speaking, okay, not everything is going to always work out. There's um, successful managers anticipate and plan for the unexpected. Dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity is important, and it requires contingency planning and crisis management. This is where problem solving and decision making come into play. Uh, very, very important. You can see here just the, the step by steps that you can go through in order to gain good problem solving and decision making pieces. Let's talk about contingency planning. That is just having a backup plan, a fallback plan. Again, we know that things are going to happen. There's inevitable failure that's going to be there. And so contingency planning is just having that alternative course of action because we know that change can occur, right? So it's that backup or fallback plan, right? Now, crisis management is how you deal with emergencies, all right? What's gonna happen if um, there's a fire at the plant? What happens if a leader in the organization is arrested for bribery? What happens if there's a product recall? These are all crisis management kind of pieces. and so. There has to be a communication plan for employees, the press, the government, and the general public. So think about leaders and what do we like in leaders, right? Part of it, we like responsibility and accountability. We want them to step up and rally, you know, this vision uh, of what that looks like. 
uh, embracing change, um, having corporate values. Now, what do followers want from, from a leader? I want you to take a moment here, think about it. What do we as followers want from a leader? So pause the video, pause me talking, and I want you to take, you know, two, two or three minutes and write down what followers want from a leader. We're all, we've all been followers at some point in our lives, including today. Uh, I am, you are, we all are. We're also leaders, you know, in many ways. But what do followers want from a leader? Okay, two, three minutes, pause, and then come back. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you have done what I've asked and that is to make notes. So take, think about it. What did you write down? Um, maybe it's recognition, you know, being recognized for doing a good job. Maybe it's being, maybe there's respect. Um, what about knowing that, that, that we're safe as followers? What about the purpose of the organization? All right, the leadership styles. I'm gonna walk through these. Autocratic manager makes decisions without input and expects subordinates to follow instructions. Now, we can think of autocratic leaders in two different ways. Many times, at least my mindset goes to, let's say, um, Kim of North Korea, definitely an autocratic leader. Um, someone tries to get input, like his, you know, his half-brother or his uncle, he just shoots them, blows them away, executes them. Um, he doesn't really want input, right? And he shows, that's, shows his leaders and his people what he's willing to listen to and what he's not willing to listen to. And most of the time is he's not willing to listen. It's his way or no way. Very autocratic. Now, on the positive side, many times we need autocratic managers. For example, you know, God forbid we're on the interstate, there's a wreck, we pull up, we're the first on the scene. Um, you know, there's blood, there's crash, there's all kinds of things going on. Quite frankly, we need someone to take charge. You know, um, typically, hey, anyone here in law enforcement, anyone here a first responder, you know, call nine. We need someone to take charge. You know, if we're at a fire, you know, let's say an apartment building and the fire is going on, we want the fire chief to arrive. We want he or she to take charge, move the people out, get the uh, get the residents out. We need an autocratic manager. So think about that. Now, there are some managers that want to be participative. They want a democratic kind of style. So they seek input from people. They'll go around the room and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Maybe they have a, an open door policy where they allow people to come in, share their concerns. Maybe they do a survey on a regular basis. That's participative, democratic, sort of taking in. Before they make a decision, they're seeking input, right? Free reign. So a free reign manager typically has trust. Their employees have good credibility. They provide some guidance. Um, they know, but, but the workforce know what they have to do. They're trained, they go out and do it. Um, a good example of this, I was in sales and marketing the last 12 years. Um, you know, I knew the job, I knew the mission, I knew our strategic plan. We had operation and tactical plans. For a while, I reported to the VP of sales and marketing. Once I was promoted, I reported to the president. Both of them gave me free reign. They knew what I needed to do. Um, you know, there was trust and credibility. We had a team of 10, and some of us had to be micromanaged. Most of us did not have to be micromanaged. We went out and did our jobs. Did we check in? Absolutely. Were there performance reviews? Yeah, absolutely. But they were free reign managers and allowed us to go out and do it. Now, transactional style, a little bit different. Transactional style is, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a clear understanding of roles, responsibilities, accountability, responsibility uh, from that. And so they'll let the subordinate know what's expected of them and then step in when mistakes are made. A good example of this would be in hospitality, whether it's a restaurant, you know, where you've got the, the folks at the front line taking orders in, trying to coordinate and provide good customer care and good customer service to, uh, you know, to the guests. Um, when something goes wrong, the manager needs to step in, talk to the employee, hopefully away from the customers and let them know. In a hotel situation, for example, you know, it might be, hey, you just gave out room 314. Turns out room 314 is not clean yet. 
Here's what you need to do in the future to avoid that type of mistake, transactional. The last, but certainly not least, is transfor uh, transformational. Transformational. And so transformational, the type of uh, leader that steps up and motivates their workforce through um, mentorship, coaching, advising. They're looking out for their employee, their future of that employee, giving updates on a very on a regular basis, um, looking at the organizational goals and positioning the people and the people there. Um, I've had a couple of transformational uh, leaders in my you know in my um, historic in my history. Um, you know, one was very close to me, Kevin Casey. Again, he was the vice president of sales and marketing. Hard guy. I mean, tough, tough, tough. But I loved his tough love. Um, you know, where are you at? What are you doing? Okay, great. Go make that happen. Don't forget you have sales goals. Don't forget you got to hit your targets. Uh, but then on a Friday, for example, you know, I'm on the air. I'm at the airport getting ready to get on the airplane. Or maybe I've just landed and I'm getting in the car to drive home. How was your week, Ron? Tell me about it. Um, and then, you know, let's talk shop for a couple minutes. And then he would flip and say, how are the kids? You know, how are Andy doing? How's Andy doing? I saw he had a great soccer match. Bailey and Hunter, how are the twins? You know, school going away, going okay. How's your love life, Ron? How are things going? I mean, didn't have to. That's not part of the role and responsibilities, but he wanted to. You know, transformational. He gave me the motivation to go back to school, to work on my master's degree you know, and actually helped coach me through that entire process. So transformational mentors, motivators, definitely there. All right, here's controlling, right? So remember controlling, we've set the goals and objectives. We now can measure, think about those sales goals, $200,000 in the first year. Where are we at in six months? Where are we at in nine months? So we can start to compare the actual performance and understand this was the goal, but here's where we are. Why? Why? What is causing the deviation there? What's the reason for it? Now, sometimes this is where good leaders start to separate out just from managers, okay? Because this isn't where we want to blame. Certainly, we want to understand the reasons for the deviation, what's causing it, and we want to take corrective action. But this isn't where we just immediately jump in, knee-jerk, and start to blame. Um, again, manager, leader, very different, okay? But understand the processes and the, and the procedures for controlling. All right, benchmarking. Benchmarking gives us a chance to understand um, what should we be doing? What could we be doing? So it's, you know, comparing to competition or other industries um, that are like or similar to an organization. So evaluating similar companies. And why do we do this? Because we want to improve, right? We want to improve as an organization. We want to improve our people, our processes. Sometimes, you know, you'll do benchmarking for salaries to make sure that, that organizations are paying their people total, total compensation. So not only base pay, but medical, dental, all the benefits that are in there, we'll benchmark that. Sometimes benchmarking, Effect, uh, excuse me, efficiencies, manufacturing efficiencies. Where are we at? What are we doing? Virginia Tech, right, as a higher ed, um, you know, as an organization, looks at benchmarks on a very regular basis. Every college looks at, they might benchmark their peer organization, uh, their peer schools, University of Indiana, Purdue, Georgia Tech, uh, University of Georgia, whatever that school might be, looking at what their practices and processes are and are there opportunities then for that organization to come through. Why do we do this? Great chance to exchange ideas, certainly a good opportunity to improve efficiency. And anytime we can improve efficiency, we, you know, if we take time out of the equation, we lower cost, all of a sudden we, we start to raise our profit as well, okay? Just some various management skills. I'll let you, uh, you know, again, these are in the textbook. Just understand, you know, technical is the accounting, marketing, medical, healthcare, whatever that specific technical uh, skill is. Uh, conceptual is looking at um, the ability to reason abstractly and analyze complex situations. 
Interpersonal, this is where there is a huge gap in industry today. And I'm, this isn't a generational blame. That's not it at all. I think it's a societal blame. I think people um, have a hard time working with other people. Uh, they get turned off by people and they have a hard time getting motivated to be around people. And so this is where interpersonal skills um, can, can, and while you're here at Virginia Tech, a great opportunity for you to improve your interpersonal skills. There is a video at the end of the chapter. Please take the time to watch this based on leadership and management and the why. Um, I, I find it inspirational. I hope you do as well. Um, as always, as you're marching through, walking through, doing the crosswalk of every module or in the textbook, feel free to reach out. I know that's becoming probably mundane for you, but at the end of the day, I want you to know I'm here. I'm here to help. Certainly schedule office hours, reach out to me, let me know how we can do that. So that concludes chapter eight, um, starting to finish up uh, the, the end of week three. So we're getting through uh, almost finishing up the halfway point here in summer session. With that, I hope you all take care, have a great rest of your day and continue to enjoy your summer. Take care.